If you have hanged around the art world at all, you must have heard the phrase avant-garde, which means vanguard in English. The person who deserves this word the most is Cezanne, who is a true pioneer. You probably still remember those scenery paintings we showed in episode 14. Now look at this cubist painting by Georges Braque. We can safely say that Braque picked up where Cezanne left off. In future episodes, when we talk about Picasso, we shall see how he developed Cezanne's attempt to show different views of the same object. Also, we shall see how Cezanne's work on color balance impacted colorist painters like Matisse, Durain, and Vlaminck. Before we get to today's topic, which is Cezanne's impact on expressionism, let me first make a side note. We hear a lot of words that are supposed to represent different styles of paintings. In modern art, first, many of these words were created by the painters themselves. Therefore. The tendency of self-aggrandizement was inevitable. Second, many of the words, such as impressionism, were created by critics of the time, who probably did not understand the effort of the artists. As we have learned, impressionism was coined in a derogatory sense for lack of substance. In any case, as long as these words caught on for the first time, they were likely to stay unchanged. The lack of hindsight is inevitable. So, when you see the word impressionism, you probably want to ask, "Isn't that every painting under the sun trying to do?" When you see the word expressionism, you can fairly ask exactly the same question. But throughout the years, those were the words used in association with those painting styles. Obviously. It is a fool's exercise to develop a new set of words to represent those painting styles and movements, so we're stuck with them. The best way to handle the situation is probably to live with it, and when necessary, try not to read too much into the everyday meanings of the words. Once we know the limitations of these terms, they will do just fine for us to identify different styles and movements. I'm certainly not trying to insult any expressionists out there, but before Pissarro and Dr. Gachet got to Cezanne in early 1870s, he was an expressionist. We'll talk more about that later in this episode. In the first episode that we discussed Cezanne, episode 13, we mentioned Gustave Giffard's comment that Cezanne was a peculiar character, timid and violent, emotional in the extreme. Cezanne's subjects in this period were murders, rapes, and orgies. Those subject matters themselves were not new. If you have watched episode six, you know what Goya did to his kitchen. The issue here is not whether Cezanne did any murder, rape, or orgy scenes. The issue is what he did with those scenes. This is the abduction by Cezanne in 1867. We don't know whether this is Hercules rescuing Alcestis from the underworld, or the abduction of Proserpine by Pluto, but we know that this is not in the style of classic paintings by Rubens, Colossus by Goya, or anything contemporary, such as the style of Manet. We do know, as we can see, that it is a mixture of violence, eroticism. A romantic fantasy. Comparing this with Goya's Saturn devouring his son, you can probably agree with me that Cezanne went beyond Goya. In a difficult situation and weird mental state, to say the least, Cezanne developed this combination. Maybe we can think about this painting this way. Can you imagine a way to construct this sensation in any style prior? Or contemporary to Cezanne, because of the obvious lack of resisting from the woman, this painting is not nearly as offensive as other rape paintings. 
This painting was first exhibited under the title of the Feast. Today, it is better known as the Orgy. Although there is not much on the table, this is clearly an eating orgy. From the relaxed body postures and overturned jars, we can safely say that this is the aftermath. I'm not sure whether this woman is cleaning up or putting out more food. I wonder whether these people started the feast naked or became this way somehow during it. In fact, it is not hard to imagine that between the meal and this painting, something else has happened. But whatever decadent and violent things that these people have just gone through, this painting, just like the last one, shows a lack of offensiveness. Traditional painters such as Veronese and Rubens painted feast scenes at the height of eating. Cezanne depicted the time when all the energies were spent. Maybe he was too nervous in that period to handle the energies. Here is another feast painting. It is more or less the same thing. Instead of oil, this one was by gouache, watercolor, pastel, and crayon on cardboard. This one is called the murder. Instead of the aftermath, this one is right in the middle of the act, as dark as the background. Look at her face, showing more surrendering than anything else. At least her left arm and hand could be used to generate some resistance. This one is called Strangled Woman. Look at the victim's face and arms. Do you see anything other than surrendering? Going through Cezanne's murder, rape, and orgy scenes, we see that even in his darkest moments, when he needed the help of Dr. Gachet, who also helped Van Gogh, by the way, this peculiar character, timid and violent, emotional in the extreme, according to Jeffroy, demonstrating his desire for peace. This is something that we shall compare with Van Gogh later. Of course, I'm not doing these paintings to psychoanalyze Cezanne. I'm after the expression of the emotions, which would be called expressionism in a few decades. Cezanne painted these paintings when he was about 30 years old. In that narrow 10-year period, which is considered his dark years, we see him developing something that will be made into a major movement in modern art. I'm not going to discuss Expressionism now. For now, I just want to say that we call Cezanne a genius because even in his dark hours, he was producing paintings groundbreaking. At the end of this four-episode mini-series on Cezanne, I just want to say that psychologically, all good artists are extremely sensitive, much more than normal people. For instance, they will be hurt much more than average people when seeing other people suffering. When we see many artists excelling at a certain time and place, here I mean Paris in the 1800s and early 1900s, it is definitely a statement on the tolerance of that society at that time. Even for the awkward loner like Cezanne, he painted with Pissarro and was advised by him. Whatever happened between him and Monet, he painted for a while at Monet's home in Givigny. He also had a lot of interactions with Renard. Cezanne's influence on other artists is immeasurable. Once he complained publicly that Gauguin stole his ideas, 
we can safely say today that all modern painters after him stole his ideas in one way or another. Beyond painting, let me quote Hemingway: "I was learning something from the painting of Cezanne that made writing simple true sentences far from enough to make the stories half the dimensions, but I was trying to put in them. I was learning very much from him, but I was not articulate enough to explain it to everyone. Besides, it was a secret." Unquote. For me, it was Hemingway who showed me the power of short sentences. So I try not to be like so many lawyers who make writing never-ending sentences a virtue. I'll see you next time.